Episode 162 of the 4x4 podcast is brought to you by Artemis Overland Hardware. Artemis Overland Hardware is a family business with a huge selection of Overland equipment in stock for online orders, or you can visit the showroom located in Springfield, Missouri. Either way, Artemis Overland Hardware will get you equipped and ready for all your adventures, wherever they may take you. You're listening to the 4x4 podcast. The podcast all about four-wheeling, overlanding, off-road racing, and the outdoor lifestyle. We talk about news, tips and tricks, answer your questions, and interview big and little names in the off-roading world. So whether your rig is busted and you're in the shop wrenching on it, or you're on your way to the trail, join us and we'll keep you plugged in on topics to help you get away. Here are your hosts, Dan, Craig, and Rich. Hello, I am Dan, your host of the 4x4 Podcast, and we have Rich. How are you doing tonight? I'm great. How are you? Awesome. And Craig, how's it going? Uh, hanging in there. Okay. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Uh, so we've got a really fun show tonight. We have an interview with Micah, who is, he's on YouTube and Instagram uh, as Overland Under Budget, Overland Under Budget. And Micah Weber, he's really, uh, you know, I kind of gravitated towards his Instagram account before I found the YouTube um, when I was doing some research on welders way back. And since then, Micah and I have interacted a bunch. And, you know, he's he's got a really kind of inspirational story on, uh, like, Just his background in off-roading, how he came into it, and then fabrication is really – the things that he's done with his Toyota Tacoma are just outstanding. And it it shows that uh, anybody can, you know, take a, you know, an old tired truck and turn it into something that meets your needs – uh, for for yourself and all your family adventures. So uh, before we get into anything else, let's go ahead and jump to that interview with Micah, Overland Under Budget. Tonight on the podcast, I'm really excited to have Micah Weber. How are you doing tonight? Oh, doing super good, Dan. Thanks for having me on here. Oh, yeah, super, super excited to be on. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really excited to get some of your time here because I've been following you on Instagram for quite a while. Uh, that's really kind of how I first interacted with you. And uh, what has inspired me is just kind of watching your growth in, like, fabricating things and how you've modified your, your Tacoma and everything. Um, and I really want to talk about all of that and how you're transforming these projects into things that other people can do. Uh, but before we talk about all of that, I want to kind of get to know Micah first. So what's your what's your background? How did you kind of get into the off-roading and adventure lifestyle stuff? Yeah, that's a funny question because, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm, I'm probably going to go off on a lot of tangents. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever been interviewed or on a podcast, so you'll have to cut me off if I go too long. But um, I've grown – so I grew up in a family of five kids, Um I moved around a ton um, as a as a kid and as an adult, um, somewhere over like twenty six times. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, they lived so lived in a bunch of different places and stuff. Just always been really outdoors, active. Um, lived on a farm for a little while. Um, drove tractors when we were kids. You know, dirt bikes. My dad was super into all things mechanical. He was a machinist. Um, made parts for aircraft, made parts for the dental industry, for space shuttles. I mean, pretty pretty standard machinist type of thing. He ended up running machines and stuff like that. <clears throat> but he'd always had just a love for motorcycles, cars, anything, you know, mechanical and stuff sure. like that. And he definitely passed that down to us. So I think it, I, if I was to say, like, you know, how I got started in off-road, it wasn't necessarily that I got started in off-road. It's just from... Be, since I was a kid, I was just in, we were just in all things cars, all things with a motor, basically. So, yeah. um, you know, when we were on the farm, we were into tractors and we were into doing anything in the mud and monster trucks. I can still remember like the time my parents took us to a monster truck show and we were just like flipping our lid. And <laughs> that was back before the, you know, the internet was like, I, I don't want to say back before the internet because it wasn't that long ago it was like in the late 90s but it was back before you had internet where you could be like i'm gonna search a youtube video and watch the monster truck right so we used to like we used to go to the library 
repetitively and be like, do you have any books on monster trucks? Do you have any movies on monster trucks? Every time like, no, but (laughs) anyways, you could see like, just as kids, we just grew up with, someone gave us a gigantic pile of Legos. Um, and we started out, you know, uh, younger than 10 years old, just playing with Legos and trying to build whatever came to mind. We'd build, you know, who could build the best four wheel drive and we'd build like a legit, you know, actual four wheel drive, solid axle, just Lego thing and put a little Lego motor on it and, and, uh, you know, see who could <laughs> go the farthest <laughs> with that and stuff. So I guess, and then, you know, I have other memories of, um, my grandfather on my mother's side worked, um, in the aircraft industry for Northrop Grumman and later went into automotive racing as like a hobby when he retired. So he was big into the, getting into that. Um, less of like on a hands-on level, but more of, you know, he did like some racing and stuff like that. So he had a bunch of VHS tapes on like, um, I want to say Bob Bondurant. I I think that might be, I might be butchering it. Someone's going to know which one it is, but there's racing, a famous old school racing school for street. And then he also had these VHS that were like the, um, kind of like the camel trophy. Oh yeah. Um, stuff. And they had, yeah, they had a bunch of Land Rovers and, um, and it was like off-road driving school. Like if you could imagine on a VHS, like don't approach a ditch, like with both tires going in at the same time, you know, like <laughs> and, and we were, you know, 10 and 11 years old and we just like, we just rewatch and rewatch. And then we oh, yeah. take his ride on lawnmower out and try and get it stuck and try and you know unstuck it and (laughs) learn the difference of going in the ditch with both front tires versus you know yeah it was like you know it's like one of those things where you're like it's like a skill where you're like oh i'm gonna you know can i make it through this obstacle i mean that was like when we were you know 10 to well from from as long as i can remember we were doing stuff like that probably still Um, if you had a riding lawnmower let's be real (laughs) oh i plan to get one there you go (laughs) have you seen the gamma 500 lawnmowers yeah. <laughs> Have you seen that Instagram account that popped up? It's like, okay, off-road lawnmowers. <laughs> yes. Dude, they blew up. They We're totally going on a rant right now, but I freaking love that Instagram because they are so about it and they are so serious. But it's like, I know I have firsthand experience that that is super fun. Oh, and yeah. I feel like that is what off-roading is to me. It's like, it's fun. I'm like, no one, I'm not doing that here to save my life or make a living i'm sure i'm out here doing because i have fun and like i can see that in that channel so much i'm just like i can't believe they put a winch on the lawnmower but (laughs) (laughs) you could just pick it up but i love it it's like super awesome so uh, it's a long a really long way of saying i guess i've just always been into off-road my entire life um on road and off-road but right now it's the focus is off-road because i got a truck and had a bunch of stuff I've always wanted to do to a four wheel drive. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned moving around a lot. Was this all around the United States or around the world or has it all been kind of Western United States? No. Yeah. It's more boring than that. Uh, (laughs) it's, 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 uh, Western West coast. So Oregon, Washington, California. And the majority of it is like the same locales. Like we lived, I was born in, in LA and then we, and then, you know, so multiple moves in between being born in LA living on a farm in Sio, Oregon, uh, and then living in a house in Vancouver, Washington, and then basically all around those areas. So I've lived in Santa Barbara, Santa Monica, Calabasas, Carpinteria. I don't know. No one will know these names. (laughs) San Luis Obispo, Vancouver, Washington, Portland, Sio, Oregon, you know, all over, up and down, but not like, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to Missoula. Oh, we're going to Kentucky. It It was just basically kind of following my gotcha. dad's work a little bit and opportunities and kind of stuff like that. So, yeah, that sounds good. Well, so I know yeah. right now you've got a, a Tacoma that has all kinds of tricks in there. <laughs> I, I like it a lot, but uh, Thanks. <laughs> I think there's some other vehicles that probably led up to the Tacoma or that still exist. <laughs> what else uh, yeah. what kind of vehicles you had in the past? It, that's a funny question because it brings up my first and probably like favorite well, I mean, your first car is always kind of like, you can't say it's your favorite, but it's like, it's like something special yeah. for most people. So it's right on track with the budget theme too, because when, um, when, when I graduated, my grandparents gave us, um, gave me like $5,000 to buy a car and 
you know, just kind of get set up, which was super generous. And that's a lot more than a lot of people got or get, but, um, that was my situation. And I took a thousand dollars and I bought a 2001 Toyota Echo that was salvage title with no front bumper and manual transmission with the clutch going out and roll up doors or roll up windows. And it was my first transaction on Craigslist and a thousand dollars cash. And there was someone else there. They're like, we're going to give you 1300 right now. He's like, well, this guy was here first. (laughs) And you know, I'm going to give it to him. And so I forgot to grab the title. Uh, (laughs) Long story short, that car was my first car, which like, I have so many fun memories. It was a, I don't know. I'll have to send you, I'll send you a picture after this, but I got it with like 50,000 miles on it and uh, put a new clutch in it bucks, and then just basically thrashed that car and just drove it everywhere up until um, three years ago or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe four years ago. Yeah. I put over a hundred thousand miles on it. It like went around the family as whenever, when anyone needed a vehicle, it was like always there made multiple trips between LA and Portland and um, did some, <laughs> some sketchy rally driving, <laughs> almost wrapped it around a tree. And yeah, that's actually one of my favorite memories is in that car with my older brother. We were in Washington going up this uh, mountain that we always used to go check out called Larch mountain. And there's a bunch of um, logging roads and stuff like that. And uh, it gets snowy up there and there's like a shooting pit where people just go shoot, you know, but up to the pit you got you know like a foot of snow or something and so only trucks were up there and we tried going up we got like you know 100 yards away and we're like well let's try that again so he's got a longer run up <laughs> get a we running got, like, start at it yeah we got like to the pit and we're like and then we back down again everyone's like watching us like what the heck and then we just went as fast as we could and we just like made it up and then the last section we were just gliding like on the on the bottom of the car over the snow just to the, <laughs> it was amazing like that kind of stuff, I think, just goes back to like not. It's not about the vehicle. It's not about the gear. It's not about the money or anything. Whether yeah. you spent a lot or you spent a little, it's just like it's just like having fun in a vehicle. Vehicles are are so fun. Yeah, so, absolutely. That's my Especially first car. When it's cheap and you don't feel restrained, yes. like you have to take a ton of care of it. Just get creative and have some fun with no. it. No. Yeah, and I don't like to thrash things. Like I'm not like I like to take care of things. And that car was like clean all the time on the inside the paint was terrible and one of the doors was kicked in and there's only hubcaps on one side <laughs> but um <laughs> it was like the good side paint had the hubcaps and the bad side paint didn't so kind of even but it um out. yeah you kind of just made if you were passing by someone you're trying to impress you gotta go on the driver's <laughs> side but uh but anyways um that car i had forever and then once I got married, I got married with that car, which is incredible. If you saw a picture of the car. Um, and then we had a four wheel drive, um, Kia Sorento, which was cool. A little manual four wheel drive Kia Sorento, just, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Everything we bought car wise was just paid cash. Like just Craigslist. I've never, we've never, never bought a car that (laughs) wasn't on Craigslist, (laughs) which sounds, you know, might sound like, this guy's kind of a weirdo budget no, guy, but it wasn't Jeep that. It's just eBay, like finance. So. What's that? <laughs> I bought oh, yeah. my Jeep oh, on yeah. eBay. I, so. My dad bought a car in Florida on eBay, and we drove it across the the state or the the, <laughs> the country. But uh, but anyways, I'm going off in the weeds. I've had that car, and then we had a Kia Sorento four wheel drive, which was fun. Um, we had a Jetta TDI, which was great. Oh, yeah. I really liked that. Yeah. Like back when they were good, it was like a 2006. It was all leather. It was manual. It was amazing. And that had another Jetta right when they got um, – actually, that Jetta got totaled. We rolled that money from the insurance into a Jetta on Craigslist. That ended up getting bought back for more than we bought it for. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> it was like it was Thank you, EPA. Cool. Like, yeah, we just <laughs> kept it rolling. But yeah, and then um, I actually have a, it's funny, I actually have a Porsche Cayenne Turbo S, um, which is also Craigslist. Um, and I was going to say that somehow fits into the the under budget theme somehow. Yeah. I know. I wanted to slide that in there because people are probably like, what? This guy's a fake. But actually, I bought that car for $12,000 um, and it's probably worth less. You know, $12,000, you could probably sell my truck for more than that right now. So, um 
but that's also a really fun car that I did a lot of modification to, and that's our family car. So I have that, the 2006 Cayenne Turbo S, and the 2001 Toyota Tacoma. All right. So now the Tacoma. This is kind Long of answer. the the yeah. <laughs> central kind of character in the Overland Under Budget Instagram account. Yeah. Um, so what all have you done to the Tacoma? Oh, no. <laughs> like everything? <laughs> or... Well, let's start at the front okay. and work our way back from there. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I'll, yeah. Or I, I would like to do that, but I think I'm just going to have to go with what comes off my top of my head in order. Because <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll work it. with that too. So, yeah, I bought it um, totally stock from the original family who owned it. Um, got it on Craigslist again. I had just sold. We had a BMW. I had sold that. And same day, you know, I had the cash in hand, and I was just like – we just moved too from Calabasas to where we live now on the central coast, which is like so kicked back and there's dirt roads everywhere. And so it just didn't make sense to have a lowered BMW. Right. So I was like, I think I'm going to finally get a track. Like I've always wanted to have a track and uh, I think it makes the most sense to do it now. So anyways, bought the Tacoma from a couple of streets down from me. I went over to look at it actually. And he had it up for like 6,500 bucks. And I was like, Hmm, no, and then I came back in like the next day and he's like, I had to raise the price to 7,500. I didn't know anything about how much they were worth. Anyways, I bought it 7,500 from the same family. And then, um, same day that I bought it, um, I got a rear bumper on Craigslist. Um, and then I did just a simple Bilstein 5,100 lift front and back. So stock coils with the Bilstein 5100s up front, just set on the high preload. Mm -hmm. And then I did an Adelief in the back, which I later changed to buying a used set of Leafs from a same year to Tacoma and chopped them up and made my own like expedition pack, if you will. Sure. It's just got three extra Leafs in it from a Tacoma. <clears throat> so that's the rear and front suspension. Otherwise, it's stock upper and lower control arms. I had just ordered new lower ball joints just because I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> thinking they're going to fall <laughs> off. Um, it's got one and a quarter inch wheel spacers to clear the width of the um, 285, 75 R16 tires, the KO2s. Um, it's got a coastal off-road self-weld kit for the front bumper. It's the closed top winch bumper. Um, which I really like and actually kind of cool. I might, um, I might have something cool coming out with, with coastal off road too, um, sometime in the future. It's got a, um, worn, uh, Evo VR 10 S. I think I butchered the order of that, but it's got a <laughs> synthetic line winch, 10,000 pounds. Um, and I bought that actually, it's kind of like one of the nicest things on the truck. I bought that with some money that I got for a magazine feature of the truck, which was so kind of a special to me because it's people are like, I can't believe you bought a like, you know, premium winch. Anyways, um, it has no mad retrofit headlights, projector headlights. Um, it has, I'm trying to think of anything else that it's like you could buy off the shelf on there. The other, everything else I've done to it has been like custom. So I have a 10 inch touchscreen in the, in it with front and rear facing anytime cameras um so i can turn them on like on the trail I was using it today it was amazing that's um, pretty slick it's in it it's so nice like when you're cresting you know really steep hills which is what i was doing all day today like really yeah. steep you just cannot see anything and you don't know if it goes left or if it goes right and the camera you can just point and you see exactly where you're going it's so yeah. nice um so front and rear cameras 10 inch touchscreen it's an aluminum uh dash piece that i made it holds the head unit. It holds uh, six rocker switches and the climate controls and some USB ports. That's one of the projects that I want to bring to market for other people. Um, and, and man, there's so many things. The roof rack is made from, <laughs> this is probably getting really boring. The roof rack on the top of the cab is made uh, by myself from some parts I had in the garage and on Craigslist. The rear roof rack, the rear rack that's on the camper shell is 100% handmade in the garage as well. I made a tube bender from some scrap metal, bent it up, and welded it up. Um, yeah, I saw the got video how you did that tube bender for the square tubing. Like, oh yeah, that, that is so I cool. 
I need to do an actual YouTube video on that. Um, it, you know, I, all this stuff, it's like, you know, I'd say like, I did this, I did that, but it's like, you know, I'm on YouTube trying to find any information I can. And so I'm taking a huge inspiration on a lot of these, you know, all these things, but, sure. um, so yeah, roof rack, cab rack made by hand. It's got a 270 degree awning, self-supported awning, which is kind of one of the more popular projects that I did, um, all made in the garage. And, um, that's, a, that's another cool thing that people actually have been able to use a template that I made to make that. Um, <laughs> and still more stuff. It's got a full belly skid made from scrap metal front to back all the way to the center su- or the, the rear diff support. So like as far as you can take it, basically, <laughs> um, it's got rock sliders that I made. Um, once I got the welder, it has, uh, now it has a completely homemade rear bumper, with integrated air hose, uh, trailer brake setup, uh, tire carrier swing out with a drop down table. Um, which by the way is super sick. I, I love that. Oh, thing. thanks. Dan. That is Gosh, it awesome. sounds, I feel like terrible. Just keep rambling on, on all this stuff on my truck, but I guess that's why people might be here. But, uh, yeah. And then at the inside, it's got a fold away bed system that I made, I mean, say system, it's a piece of plywood that's folded up like, <laughs> like, like an accordion. Um, but it works awesome because it's like, so basically takes up one foot of depth and four or five inches of height at the very back of the truck. So it's like, you got a fully usable bed. Cause I had made drawers, I had made a full platform. And then I was just like, this is just, you know, I'm not like out there months at a time. I'm like, Oh, I got a time I can go spend the night. So it's yeah. like, makes way more sense to just have something that is a truck and yeah. then I can use it. So that way you can still use the truck as a truck. Yeah. I can still put a bike. I mean, the truck is so small anyways, you know, it's like, Hey, you got your truck. Could you come pick up my bed? It's like, uh, probably fit better in your sedan. <laughs> <laughs> the truck is so small. We can put it on, but, the, uh, rack, on the rack just like we would on yeah. uh, your car. Actually. Yeah, I know. And that's, what's been cool about having the dual roof racks. And especially cause the front roof rack is based on Yakima crossbars, which have like a 600 pound static load yeah. limit. So I put, I don't know, like 400 pounds of steel on the top of the car all oh, the wow. time, you know, well, tons it, of tubing. It may be important for some people that aren't familiar with it, but the, yeah. the cab and the camper topper kind of will mm-hmm. move independently um, just yeah. because of the way the a truck is, you know, designed. And that's why you'll see yeah. trucks that have a rack on the cab and then a rack on the bed or over the, on the topper. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's not like, it's not really best practice. Like you wouldn't want to lash down something heavy on the front that continues onto the back and then do a trail where you're articulating, you know, you're yeah. going to put weird, your rack. It's a good way but to crack a fiberglass street, topper. Yeah, <laughs> that too. But on the street, uh, it's totally fine. And like I throw a giant canoe up there and all that kind of stuff. And, sure. Um, but yeah, I think there's some other stuff missing. I made a little seat delete platform in the back and, um, I've got some electrical panel, you know, stuff in the back for like controlling the lighting from while I'm in the cab. Like if I'm sleeping, I can turn on all the lights <laughs> without having to get out of the car, Right. Um, charge a phone and little, just like little things. Um, but I think that's, I think that's everything like for the most part. <laughs> yeah. A bunch well, of stuff. So, <laughs> you know, we crazy. talked a little bit about how the tinkering has led to modifying of lots of different vehicles. Um, yeah. but did you have a a background in fabricating anything or is it just kind of general carpentry and tinker skills? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if I honestly Legos, um, well, I, so the other thing was I was homeschooled my whole life, my whole, all the kids were. And, um, I think that that contributed to one, having a curious mind and my parents being amazing parents for us, um, focused spend a, you know, focus a lot of their life, spending time with us in kind of exploring things we wanted to do and stuff. And my, like I said, my dad was a machinist and into cars. And so we grew up swapping motors and timing engines and, you know, equal length headers and things like that were always buzzing around. So, um, we worked with him as much as we could, you know, as much as we wanted and then building Legos and it just naturally grew to, I love like the problem solving part of fabricating. And I also love like when I was a kid, my dream job would have been, if you had asked me, it would have been to be a, like an automotive engineer to be not like someone like, Oh, you know, this is too much wind resistance, but someone like designing a front 
suspension, you know, to have more travel and yeah. be able to blah, 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 or something like that. So that's kind of where it started. And then um, that just was, you know, natural. Like I love building stuff. So I built our bed frame, I built a coffee table, bookshelf, you know, and then did as much as I could out of wood. And it's like, you know, if you want to build stuff for your toy that you can drive in, it's got to be metal. So yeah. I've always wanted to weld. I just like, I, I don't know what it was, but I just thought like, well, welding, you know, one day I'll go to school and learn how to weld. And it's like, the tools are super expensive and you, yeah. it's not something you can just do, you know, and, but that is so wrong. And like, that's one, that's kind of one of my missions the last couple of months is like people just get a welder and start welding. Cause yeah. it's really not that hard at, at all. Um, to MIG weld, um, to to just put two pieces of metal together, you can do it. Like yep. I could show you in five minutes, and you could you could do it. Like so. Long story short, I guess I just have always been building, tinkering, fixing, taking apart things, trying to. <laughs> that reminds me, we so we like I said we always into cars and stuff. We had RC cars growing up, and day one, you know okay, we're going to enter it into like the local race. Like, okay, we'll black out the wheels, trim the knobbies because it's on the street with, you know, we clippered off the, like basically the sand paddles to make them slicks, like open up the air filter shroud, make a skid plate for the bottom. Like, can we lower it? You know, we softened up the tires with WD-40 for more traction. And like, <laughs> just like, you know, it's like, you, it's like kind of that attitude of you see something and you're like, that's cool, but you know, how can I make it perform better? Whatever sure. it is you know, coffee table or <laughs> Tacoma. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and, and I think that may have been how I found you because I just, yeah. I had ordered a, a Forney uh, oh. MIG welder. And then I think it was just in the process of, you know, I'm waiting for the delivery to arrive. Let me learn a little bit more about this machine. And then I saw that you had recently got one. Yeah. Uh, and I think that may have been how I, I discovered your Instagram account. Ah, that's account. cool. That's so cool. Yeah. So, you know, getting the welder, and I want to hear more about your welding, your welder and projects oh. and stuff too. But, <laughs> get, <laughs> but getting the welder was was an incredible. It's kind of a long story too. I'll I'll skip the long story. But, um, as you might guess, we were on a budget based on my, you know, we the theme. Budget. I like it. Yeah, we were on a budget. Um, and I had just, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to get a welder. Like, I just want a welder. And my wife and I were just kind of going back and forth, like husbands and wives do just, you know, harm, harmless. you like, I'm going to, I'm just going to buy one. Like, no, just wait, you know, there. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to buy a cheap one. And then I was like, oh, you know, I'd love to just have a nice one because I'm going to do a bunch of, yeah. anyways, um, I was like, you know, I'm just going to wait till I can save up and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like one of those things you just want to spend money you don't have and, <laughs> but didn't let myself do it. Anyways, I have my sticky note of wish list items right here. Like I get Yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. It doesn't really change even if you have, if you're not on a budget, it's like, there's just always things where you're just like, Oh, oh yeah. I'll buy that one. day. But anyways, Forney was having a, a giveaway, like just a giveaway on Instagram. And I just entered and I just put my name in <laughs> and I won. And I was like, I could not believe it. It was, it's such a game changer for me. Um, and that company has been really cool to work with. And now, so I won a thousand dollar, basically an over a thousand dollar machine from them in a giveaway completely. So just total blessing to be able to start off with a really nice multi-process machine that yeah. runs on gas and can do, you know, cause then I'm not like outgrowing the machine and, and I can just continue to make my welds look as good as I, as I physically can and um yeah that turned into you know in the last couple of months me signing on with them as a like a official influencer for them so and i got another machine a plasma cutter so yeah that's how i, that's how I that's started awesome. with with forney yeah super cool that's welding is so cool so what welder did you get so i picked up the uh mp140 you know, since I'm military, I, nice. all of the housing that I typically live in is not going to have 220. Yeah. Uh, so maybe eventually I'll yeah. be able to use a welder to fund purchasing a 220 welder. Uh, but this one, it's great. Heck it, yeah. it does stick, MIG, and TIG. You have to buy the, you know, the rest of the stuff yeah. to make it a TIG welder. Um, but yeah. it'll do the process. Yeah. 
and for everything that I'm doing, not like heavy fabrication stuff, like I, I can probably make it work just fine. Mm-hmm. And I have yet to come across anything Dude. that is beyond what I've been able to do. Even if it takes multiple passes to, to fill in something, but it's done some serious welding. I've been very happy with right. it. Right. So that's good. I, I still need to get some. I ordered that's up so some cool. better flux. Yeah, I am. Um, so I only, I only. Go ahead. Oh, nice. What, what, what wire did you go with? So I've been using what, Harbor Freight. Where did Freight, you get your wire? Uh, and it's. It's horrible. Uh, so I, I picked okay. up uh, the Yes Welder. Oh, what? That uh, ruins what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, I was going to say, I just picked up some Harbor Freight wire, and I was actually impressed with it, but it's solid wire. It's uh, not yeah, flux yeah. core. So. The flux core is just horrible. And, and sticking to the budget, uh, I do not have gas yet. So Yeah, um, yeah. Sticking to flux core until I can purchase a, the gas tank uh, for the, the 7525. Yeah. But... The Yes Welder wire, I've seen some pictures of it and some reviews mm-hmm. from friends, and yeah. it is night and day difference. So it, hopefully that I've heard some really, soon. I've heard really good things about that brand in general, just being affordable yeah. and, and quality. But yeah, I feel almost like obligated to say too, like, like I mentioned before, like I am, like I was legit on a budget, but I had such a nice setup and people were like, well, this guy's not, a, I, I was given the bottle for free. I was given a welding mask from an Instagram follower. I was given the, my first set of gloves. I was given my first, uh, all used stuff, sure. you know, and then, um, and then I've done a lot of like trades and stuff too. Like, Hey, you, you know, you're a photographer. Can you take some pictures of my apartment and I'll give you a welding bottle? Like, I was like, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I ended up, you know, <laughs> positioned myself in a great spot, but you don't need, that's the other cool thing. Like you're experiencing yourself. You don't need all that to get started. And flux score has advantages too. So, yeah. Yep. Well, cool. I'm still on the learning curve. Um, but now yeah. it's one of those things, like not everybody has a welder. And once you do, and you have some level of proficiency and it's not just like, you know, chicken turds all over metal, yeah. like then people will start bringing yeah. you stuff and, you just Absolutely. keep getting better and improving. So, I've been trying to preach that too because people, you know, ask me all the time, "Hey, what welder should I get?" And I'm like, you know, this is one I have, and they're like, "Oh, you know, what's something that's way cheaper?" And you know, if you know how, if you're someone who knows who doesn't know how to build anything and just want to try welding, then yeah, I definitely think go with the, you know, just go with the starter one. But if you're someone who can already build stuff, you know, like you're building wood stuff, yeah, and you, that's the the hard part is building. Yep. It's not, it's the design, it's the fit up, it's the, the parts. It's yeah. Visualizing how it's going to go together. Yeah. You're the designer, you're the quality control, yep. you're the creator. The welding part is, is like, is the glue stick and that doesn't matter. So, however, uh, it is really cool that you can stick two pieces of metal together with, with other metal, like oh, I know. just it's the entire idea like, of it is just awesome. It's so cool. Anyways, I'm going in the weeds, but that's <laughs> super cool. Yeah. <laughs> be your longest podcast ever oh but uh i'm I'm stoked you yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) yeah well so tell me a little bit more you mentioned some youtube projects and and yeah you see i i'm impressed by how many people you have following you on instagram and it's completely deserved because you've got tons of nuggets of wisdom and experience to to share there but youtube i think is really awesome because you kind of have a longer format and you can learn even more so tell me a little bit how the, yes. the YouTube came about. That You pretty much nailed it right there was I spend, I mean, so Instagram and YouTube, I started as like one, I'm a, I was a professional photographer um, and did travel work. So I have all the photo gear and all the video gear and stuff. And I'd go through waves of being able to focus on that and also like have time to go do stuff and then being inspired. So in the very beginning, it was, you know, I got a truck. I wanted, I started the projects were just second nature, but it was like, it'd be fun to, to start like an Instagram that kind of motivated me to get outdoors more um, and to take photos because I love automotive stuff. I love automotive photography and like, this will be a fun way to kind of create in the beginning. It was like, I want to create a portfolio of work that reflects my passion because I had been shooting hotels and portraits and stuff, which I like the portraits, you know, I love that. But I was like, wouldn't it be awesome to have a dream job of like being a adventure photographer and stuff. So I was like, well, one way to do that would be build a portfolio to show people. So 
that's how I initially got started. And then it's, I've just kind of let it, you know, go with the flow of how, what I'm inspired on. And I've always enjoyed, um, teaching other people, if you would like, yeah, you know, if I have something that I can help them with, like, I love the explaining process and trying to show them how it works and same with my own kids and family. And, and it's just, it's enjoyable for me to be able to like watch somebody learn something new and yeah. feel empowered by it. You know, like, you know, you could fix this. Like, let me show you how to fix it. Like you can pull the nail out of your tire for $12 and you can do it 15 times, you know, with a $12 kit Yeah, and this is how you, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's how I was taught when I was growing up, you know? Um, so it's evolved, you know, like it's mission, but, um, it started out as me wanting to build a portfolio of images and kind of go that way. And then it just, you know, naturally went to, here's what I did on my truck and here's how, you know, you could do it too. Because when I first started looking into it, like I was like, Oh, you know, I grew up off, obviously just loving vehicles and off road. So I had like a, had my finger on like what was popular and what I kind of wanted and I always loved like the expedition looking vehicles that are built around um, function and and not form you know like right. they had a big roof rack on the top because they in the camel trophy they just had I don't even know what they were carrying it looked like you know everything. luggage and everything you know and I just <laughs> loved like you know have a winch I mean even if you could have a crane arm on the back or like it goes back to being on a farm and I just wanted like I just want the truck to be like the most useful vehicle you right. know oh someone has a flat tire i have a jack i have an air compressor i have the ability to pull the flat tire fix it right there on the spot for them like sure i'm better than triple a kind of a thing you know or yep. whatever it would be like we're stuck in the mountains and you know you're you're a boy you're just like i want to be the guy who can fix it or do it you know <laughs> so that was kind of like it just started evolving like that and i had been modifying some of my other vehicles and projects on a budget by being like, oh, you know, yeah, I want, you know, what what makes that car look so good? like, you know, they got a black, it's like a black bumper. It's having like a kind of an eye for aesthetics too. Um, but when you realize it, it's like you could do all that home. Like I did black vinyl wrap on our Porsche for the for the instead of buying like a you know two thousand dollar trim package or something. Sure. So it started like that, and. Um, yeah, I think the first project, one of the very first projects that was like popular on my truck was um, the roof lights that I still have on the on there. And yeah, it just kind of started, you know, sharing projects and, yeah. and going that way. I think I think I lost myself on that one. I didn't even know, but <laughs> what what I like <laughs> most about your with, with Instagram, yeah, what I like most about the YouTube uh, videos mm -hmm. is that you know it's very professional and very put together looking, but you're still showing what you learn throughout the process. So it's yeah. a high quality presentation of a very educational process. And, you know, I find that kind of stuff to be very inspiring. makes me want to like, I know it's, you know, nine o'clock at night, but I want to go out to the garage. I got to try something that I just saw. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, it's so fun to hear that. And um, because we'll have to go into YouTube more, but I think also to follow up on your last question, like, I was getting so many questions on the projects that I was doing on that I was showing on Instagram, but I only had 150 characters or whatever sure. character limit it is that I was like, you know, what would really be good is if I could just film a video and I could just talk for five minutes. Yeah. I could relay, you know, I could skip so many direct messages. So that's how YouTube started. I was like, here, someone on, so many people on Instagram are messaging me, like, just go watch my YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> I've got the so answer in length right here. Use this link. Yeah. And I, and I could really flush it out because there's so much more to like, well, this is why instead of saying like, here's what I did. It's like, I considered all these other options yeah. that I had thought of. And this is why I went with this one. And this is why I think you might want to. And this part's already available and it's used for some other, you know, a cutting board from the <laughs> kitchen was the mounts for my rack or something like that, you know? So it's just way better to have YouTube for that. And I have no idea of like, why it's as popular the my youtube channel has almost surpassed my instagram following like within a number of months you know so that's but, awesome uh, yeah that's why i started both of those <laughs> yeah well you know there's kind of two different communities that are in the off-roading space like this there's the ones who have the money and no time and they would just want to buy the things and put it on and then yeah. there's 
people like you and me and probably a large portion of this podcast audience that yeah. there's a, a large degree of satisfaction from being able to figure it out and put it together yourself. And then you can stand back and see, like, not only do I know the inner workings of this and I can trust it in the middle of nowhere, but yeah. the satisfaction, or not, I did that. Because I built it. <laughs> yeah. Or that. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, yeah, I'm not going to take that. And I want to <laughs> say, too, both of those people are valid. Like, that's what I want to just go back to, like, it's all about having fun, you guys. Yep. Like, unless it is your actual job or you're, like, you in the military where people's lives depend on it. It's like, come on, guys. There's no right or wrong way. But building it yourself, doing it yourself, designing it yourself is so satisfying. And it's so fun, especially with with something that you're interacting with. Like, that's why I've always loved design with like things like even as simple as a coffee table it's because you get to like you pick the height like oh it's it's the perfect height to put my feet on and also to store stuff underneath so yeah that's that's something i love about it is like like you said you know the inside and the outside of the thing you built and you know what it can handle and what it can't and then you get to then you get to enjoy your design and your mistakes too and you're like oh i'm gonna go you know that I could imagine it working a little bit better. And if I changed this design or use this material, then it would. So that's just so enjoyable to me like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of the design stuff, I noticed one yeah. of the things that uh, I have, I've been looking at, I haven't picked up myself yet is the, the 270 yeah. degree awning. You've made yeah. a template and kind of made that available to others that want yeah. to replicate it and maybe yeah. don't have the engineering skills or the, the time to, to figure it all out. Yeah. Can you tell me a little yes. bit more about that? Sure. So I had actually tried making an awning for the truck a few times, like went to the hardware store, bought a tarp, bought some tubing and just like, I'm going to figure this out. Like I just, you know, tie the, 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 uh, on, the tarp to the side of my racks and then put some poles and it was just like such a mess. I was just <laughs> like, I'm never going to set this up. Like, <laughs> this is crazy. You know, this is just dumb. And then I was like, I tried again just by like putting some poles you could thread into the rack and kind of the same shape that I have now. But that was just like, again, like, Oh, I'm going to carry around like 50 pounds of tent poles and this giant tarp. And, <laughs> and I actually reached out to a couple of companies as you would on Instagram, you know, trying to get a, a review product or something. And they're like, I was like, I can't seem to make one of these. And, and they're like, don't give up. Like you could, you could do it. I was like, all right, fine. I will do it. So, so, uh, I tried once I got the welder cause I had tried making it without a welder. And that's one of the things about having a welder is, uh, you're no longer limited to like, like looking through the hardware store, like a bin of Legos, like what is already out there that I could use to make the awning hit. Sure. Um, you're now and there was your own Lego pieces. Now and it's way more efficient yeah. and it's way simpler and it it can be, you know, it can be so much better. But anyways, um, that is the beginning of the awning. And that um, I started looking around at what awnings were out there. And there's this company, I think it's um, Kinsman Hardware. Yep, super nice guy who owns a family owns it. I think his name's Matthew. I talked with him a bunch. Super nice guy. Helped me with some of the materials lists and things like that. Um, and then I saw an Aluma cab or Alu cab awning, shadow awning and stuff. And so my design is, is based on those designs and the general 270 degree bat wing design. Um, but even with, you know, looking at one, you, you got to sit down and figure out, like, it's still kind of a mind bender, you know, you're trying to open the awning up in your brain and like, okay, where do I place the arms and how do they, how can I open three arms that are parallel to each other when they're on the truck that swing all the way around the truck without yeah. locking up on each other. And you're kind of like, Oh, you know, draw, I was, you know, using toothpicks and trying to spin them around each other and figure out, but then finally I was like, Oh, I figured it out. Like, and then, you know, then it's make a prototype and you kind of adjust the position of each one of those yep. bolts for the thing. I actually made the first awning hinge from the mounting hangers for some side steps that I took off the truck. Okay. <laughs> Cause it had like that, it had that shape. Like yeah. if you could imagine like down from the, <clears throat> the pinch weld or whatever, but anyways, that was the hardest part and the rest of it's really simple. So if you, if you got where the placement of those were, then you can make this awning like so simply. So 
made one for myself and people loved it. And I, you know, was trying to help other people make it. People were saying, can you send me a picture of the hinge? But um, I ended up just making a um, scale size printable piece of paper. So you can go on my website and you can buy a template that you can print out actual size on your printer. And it comes with a, you know, a little list of, of all the parts you need. And you can just cut that out with scissors, put it on metal and trace around it. And then it'll show you where to drill and where to cut. And and that was the most difficult part for everybody. So um, I think over 180 people have bought that. That's um, awesome. I know. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's not like it's, it's cool. The cool thing for me is, is to think that there's a hundred and <laughs> possibly 180 people with these awnings on their cars and learning how to weld and doing this for the first time with something that I kind of designed, which is, uh, I mean, you know, or not, you know, I wasn't the originator of a bat wing sure. design, but that is my original template and stuff. So, so, um, yeah, that's where, that's where the awning is. At. And I've, it's been cool to get pictures and messages. I need to do like a video or a post that shows all the pictures that people have been sending me. Um, because a lot of people are like, Hey, I just got a welder and I built your awning and like, here it is. And that's super cool. So that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's kind of the awning project. That's definitely on the list of things that I, I plan on doing. Uh, I I purchased some material thinking I would eventually start, and then I used all the yeah. square tubing on yeah. this roof rack project and a bunch yeah. of other things. And now I got to go back Dude. to the, the metal supplier and buy some more metal. <laughs> oh, bummer. No. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like going to the candy store a little bit. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what happens to the metal at my house too. It's like, I know I have that set aside for some rock sliders or something for my brother I'm building, but yeah. sure could use it right now. <laughs> oh yeah. And to, to recap for people who have no idea what the awning is, it's the budget. It, it's only, you could build it for like under 200 bucks. It uses a $10 Harbor Freight tarp, some three quarter inch um, square tubing. The whole thing you can build for under 200 bucks. And um, yeah. And if you're trying to buy something similar online, you're looking at like, 1500 and above because yeah. this one is self-supported like i could do pull-ups on the arms of it which is a big deal because it means you can set it up in the wind which we have a lot of in california um and yeah that's what makes it i feel like a fun yeah. project because it's not like oh okay i'm going to use my project once or twice like i was using it today um i used it in the parking lot of mcdonald's the other day when it was raining and my brothers and i met up just for fun and we just got coffee and you know it's corona time and you can't sit yeah. inside so we stood outside under the truck and under the <laughs> under the tarp, yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah, but. I love the idea of the self-supported awning. You know, I've got a yeah. one that is not self-supported, and it's super mm-hmm. convenient, especially out here in the Mojave Desert. You yeah. can have shade literally anywhere, but it yeah. does take a couple minutes to get set up. And you yeah. mentioned wind. Yeah. I don't know of any place that gets higher wind than the Mojave Desert. Like, yeah, you get sandblasted, uh, yeah, like crazy. So, yeah, self-supported is the way yeah. to go. It's definitely, it just makes it more fun too. Cause it's like, Oh, I can set this up in a minute, you know, and set it down, take it down in a minute. And sometimes, you know, there's not, you're not always able to put in the guy lines too, depending yeah. on the train you're on, whatever. But, yeah. Well then what else is in store? I'm, I'm sure this is not the only product that you're going to kind of share the designs on. Yeah. So I have another one actually already made and everything. I'm just, um, so it's bumper, it's brackets that mount to the back of a first generation Tacoma. So like years 95 to 2004 um, <clears throat> for short, from all the way to long bed, extended cab or double cab. And you can make, you can use these brackets. These are physical brackets, like um, to make yourself a simple tube bumper, which is the bumper that I have on the back of my truck. Um, and it's been super fun. So I, I designed the, brackets to mount onto the truck out of cardboard and then trace the cardboard onto quarter inch steel and then cut it out with an angle grinder (laughs) and you can watch that on youtube and it's it's a messy and fun uh, process and (laughs) but um that one is i feel like a less approachable for some people because it's like it requires a lot more cutting and fabbing and stuff so i was like how could i i you know, how can I do that? How can I make this one to make some money because it's fun to, to do for sure, you know, yeah. to support my project, but well, to also let people like pays for itself. Like that's awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. That it's so fun. But, um, but two, you know, this is a way for someone to build a bumper that I think is one of the 
personally one of the best looking bumpers for these trucks at home for a couple hundred bucks um and they don't have to wait and they can learn a new skill and there's just all these benefits so i was like this is really cool i designed it uh, in cardboard those measurements to my buddy who's like the expert in works we translated it i sent it to send cut send uh, which is a laser cutting service and have been working on iterations of that design. And I finally finalized it to be a full kit where you buy the brackets. You can make the brackets that has the clevis mounts that pass all the way through the bumper. So it's super strong when you're pulling on the recovery points, you're actually pulling on the frame. It's one piece, you know? And um, yeah, that product is, isn't out yet because I revised it so many times. I have, I have like the, um, the basic version of it, but um, the, the newest version, which I think is the one people want and are waiting for, I'm going to actually be making the hard parts myself. So I ordered a CNC plasma table so that I can <laughs> – more tools. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, long story short, bumper mounting brackets and then like a PDF. So people will be able to go on my website, order the steel cut brackets, Ship, I'll ship them to your house, and – there'll be like a little PDF booklet plus the YouTube video showing this is how you do it. This is the measurements. This is the cuts you make. This is the tools you need. And you're going to be able to make a really badass bumper on the back of your truck. (laughs) That is awesome. I'm excited about that one because that's the one, the thing on the back, you know, my truck, the bumper has been super fun and it, it's so functional and, and, um, yeah, products like that can be so expensive, but you could do it, you know, you could could do it yourself. So, it's one of those fun things. Yeah. Well, what other projects you have going? Is there anything else? I mean, we've covered a pretty wide yeah. range as it is, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's kind of like, like looking to the future too. So that dash piece that I made, um, people can go check that out. I have a video on YouTube. Um, it's a leather wrapped aluminum hand cut dash replacement. So you can fit a touchscreen in those trucks um, in, in a good position. And that's been super cool. So that's an Another piece that I'm working on having available for people to buy to be able to they'll still have to DIY the the wiring and yeah, yeah. and modifying the dash a little bit, but you'll be able to um, buy a piece from me for a first gen Tacoma to swap out the dash and really modernize it. Um, it might be well, 3D printed this one. Yeah, so. you mentioned the the sin cut sin. Is that something that you could also yeah. have available? Like, hey, you just take the put the order in there and yeah. you, you get the metal piece. Yeah. So there's, so either, so that's why I like with the bumper and I'm just being totally honest, like with the bumper parts, like I, I could sell the the file that I designed and spent, you know, <laughs> so many hours on making. And then, you know, for a couple, you know, maybe 20 or 30 bucks or something. And then those people could take it to send, send and they would pay around yeah. 200 bucks to get the, the metal parts. But I, you know, I put a lot of time into making those files and to feel like I'm getting my value out, I'd want to charge a little more. But then in the end, the end price for the part becomes not so budget because right. it's like you spent $50 for me and then you spent $200 from them. Yep. So I was like, well, how can I own a CNC plasma table myself <laughs> and and make parts? So I was like, well, you know, I won't have to sell the people the file and that I can cut that out and I can make it cheaper than than both. So it'll be good for both me and them. I'll cut out the middleman. And, uh, but that company is super cool and they've been super nice to me and definitely like, I still have, I'll have other products that are going to be available through yeah. them too. But cause they do tons of different, they do carbon fiber and stuff too, oh, wow. which is really cool. And they're super nice. Like I messaged them on Sunday and they've replied like immediately. So that's Definitely awesome. check out Send Cut Send. I'm not sponsored, just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> They're really cool. They're a really cool company. Um, but yeah, the dash piece is going to be one. Um, and then, yeah, just a ton of, I, I just have so many ideas that I want to, like, it's not going to stop, you know, like, oh, yeah. I want to make it, I want to make a full custom, like, center column and overhead console and whatever I can think of, you know, it's just like, it's so, if I'm, one day I'll probably make a front bumper. I don't know. Um, but, and then parts for other cars too. Like people are asking me for the bumper brackets for like the forerunners and for yeah. the second gens and the third gens. And so I'll be working on all that stuff. And that's kind of my goal this, 
this year is to kind of work myself into my childhood dream job of being an automotive designer in a way where it's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I am an automotive designer. When I am not watching the kids, I can dream up whatever I want to dream up and, and, um, and make stuff. So that's you, kind put of those kids to work. They're full of ideas. Trust me. Oh, know. <laughs> you know, those are my quality control product testers. They will, <laughs> they will destroy something you thought was invincible faster than you. Oh yeah. <laughs> you imagine. Yeah. But, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Well, yeah. if somebody wants to learn more about Micah and all the projects, where would you have them go? I mean, I guess, you know, I don't know if you'd want to learn more about me, but if you want to learn more about what I'm doing online, it's on Instagram at Overland Under Budget. And it's also YouTube. Uh, same thing, youtube.com slash Overland Under Budget. All and also word. a website. Just all one, all word. one word, yeah. Overland Under Budget, yeah. Yeah. And what For was the Instagram. website? Instagram. Just Overland Under Budget. Yeah. <laughs> you guessed it. Yeah. <laughs> I got all, I don't think anyone had that, I guess. So I got, yeah, the website you can look up with just that and then YouTube and Instagram. And um, yeah, I, I have a bio profile on the Pelican Pro team and stuff. You can, you can Google my name and I'm probably somewhere on like page five. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, all the, the work you've been doing, the things that the products that you're showing off from with Pelican are, are super awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan yeah. of Pelican cases. I've got love them. a couple yes. of them yeah. right here next to me. Uh, yeah. You know, being in the military, we're hard on everything. Yeah. Pelican cases are great. Keeps them all safe. Dude, I had the majority of all my Pelican cases before I had any affiliation with them. Yeah. And it was a budget thing too. I got them on Craigslist. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. But, I was just looking at some, uh, man, last night on the government liquidation websites, like yeah. Gov Planet and everything. Like, yeah, you can find some really good deals out there, dude. There's so many cool. There's there's like equipment too, you know, like oh yeah, fifty thousand pound metal break or something. You're like, huh? I don't have space for that, but <laughs> that'd be yeah. cool. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. Well, Mike, stuff. thanks for ha thanks for your time and coming on the podcast. I've really enjoyed yeah. our chat, and I, I think. There's a lot of people who are going to be coming over to check out all of your inspiring projects and, you know, more than 180 people making your uh, yeah. awning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm just flattered that you would ask me to be on a podcast and if anyone was listening to this, I think, you know, thanks for listening. And I hope that they can find some inspiration in the projects too. And uh, I'd really, you know, if someone, if someone sees one of my projects and tries it and feels like they, did something they didn't think they could do before. That's just like, so that's so cool to me. Like, I'd love it for people to learn how to weld, like, like I learned to weld. And, um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Awesome. All right, Micah, we'll talk to you later. Yeah. We'll definitely have to talk again, Dan. It was too much fun just chatting and stuff. But much more to cover, but oh, you yeah. have a good night and, and thanks again for having me on. Sounds good. We'll talk to you later. Artemis Overland Hardware is a local, family-run business that supplies your adventures. They have a brick-and-mortar store located in Springfield, Missouri, where you can come in and browse their huge selection of equipment. And when I say the selection is huge, I mean it's huge. Artemis Overland Hardware has a large chunk of the catalog available from Oztent, 23-0, Ezeon, Snowmaster Fridges, Timbo Tusk, Covia, Front Runner, Alu Cab, Eye Camper, Come Up Winches, Factor 55, Crazy Beaver Tools, National Luna, Red Arc, Iron Man 4x4, and Goose Gear. And that's just not a long list of brands that they carry. You know, they Aaron and his team at Artemis Overland Hardware have really built a good relationship with all of those vendors. Uh, and they provide great customer service to everybody that shops there. Your satisfaction is only able to be guaranteed because of those relationships and the trust that's been fostered between Artemis Overland Hardware and these brands. If you have any questions about anything, anything that Artemis Overland Hardware carries, then don't hesitate to call or message Aaron and his team. Check them out at ArtemisOverland.com. That's A-R-T-E-M-I-S Overland.com. And get equipped and ready for all your adventures wherever they may take you. That's ArtemisOverland.com. Check them out, hit them up on social media, and please say thanks for their continued partnership with the 4x4 podcast. All right, guys. How are uh, what all is new in uh, your world? So, Craig, uh, the the ongoing saga of the YJ. Things getting any closer? <laughs> uh, stuck in that same spot 
Um, oh, man. Just trying to get the garage cleaned up, and it's just I didn't believe how bad my garage was. <laughs> so um, I just been slowly working on it, getting the garage cleaned up, you know, because you know. Happy wife, happy life. Oh, yeah. So no, I get that. Wife says, you know, we need to get the garage cleaned up, and I agree with her. So that's uh, that's fr- first priority, but almost done with the garage. Maybe another two weeks, hopefully, of weekends working on it. And then uh, on to the Jeep. That's good. It's getting- same saga. Yeah. Stuck in the same spot. Do you think you're going to end up having to, like, get more parts or – are you confident you've discovered all of the issues that need to be solved? Uh, except for the flywheel. I have made my decision if I'm going to get a new flywheel, but I got the clutch. I got everything, you know, everything yeah. but the flywheel at this point. I am just going to try to decide if I'm going to try to resurface it or buy a new one. But I was going to decide that when I crawled under there and did the oil pan. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm stuck right now. Do you know what kind of flywheel you have that to go in there? Uh, series number? No. But uh, is, is it like a AutoZone or O'Reilly special or is it a... No, it's the original that's oh. in there. Oh. Well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the original. Yeah, I would original clutch. I would definitely be upgrading that one then. Yeah, I'm, I, that's probably what I'm gonna do. I I would hit up a uh, you know Center Force and and get one of those the the heavy dutier ones. Uh, so that way you can you know driving off road with a clutch a manual transmission. We've talked about that before. You know, it helps having a, the additional weight on that flywheel to help smooth things out and carry some momentum oh the are you talking about the flywheel that i have or the clutch because the clutch and pressure plate i have are from summit okay yeah i I would still that flywheel i I would be upgrading that one so i've had great luck with the center force clutch that i've had you know it's the one that's been in there since i the previous owner uh installed that upgraded center force clutch the whole package, the the flywheel, the pressure, the whole thing, um, in 2003. And as much off roading as I've done, it's still in there, going strong. <laughs> like that's that's a good testimonial. Yep. So, okay. Well, Rich, have you done anything but work lately? Uh, I'm on vacation as of today. On vacation. <sighs> it's my first vacation in like two and a half years. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked. So, yeah, all I've been doing is getting stuff ready for that, getting the getting the camper ready, um, all that good stuff. So, where are you going? Gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna go hit uh, Memphis, New Orleans, uh, probably San Antonio, then back up home. So, okay, yeah, that should be a good trip. Now that yeah. uh, you know your area of the country has entered and come out of the deep freeze. <laughs> all the <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was warm today i mean yeah. it was it was crazy warm yeah well that's good so well uh i have not done any off-roading either it's been nothing but discovering problems and fixing them as i as i can uh, i think last time we talked i got the power window regulator corrected i got that part in so you know all the windows are going up and down um so that's good. Uh, we were, my wife and I were getting ready to go out for a trip, and I figured, you know what? While I'm waiting around for, you know, her and the kids to finish getting stuff together, I'll go check, see if I can tighten up the the steering a little bit, just make a minor adjustment or something. And as I, like any other project, um, you do go to do one little thing, and it just spirals out of control. Discovered that there's some broken bits here. Uh, and I've got pictures here in the show notes and anybody that's been following on Instagram is probably tracking this, but the, you know, the steering box has got those three bolts holding it in there. Well, I noticed one was completely missing. Um, and when I look down in the hole, I can see the stubby little end of the bolt. So it's not like it came out, uh, just unthreaded itself. It just sheared off, cracked the bolt, 
Um, so with a loose steering box, of course, it, you know, cracked at the very top of the frame horn um, there on the Jeep. Uh, and then anybody that's, you know, had a, a TJ, YJ, XJ, you know, there's that little flimsy aluminum plate. It's like a spacer for the steering box uh, because you're trying to mount a a round thing to a flat surface. And so the way the ears are for that mounting bolts for the steering box, you know, you got to use that spacer so that it sits flush. Uh, well, the original one from Jeep is just a flimsy little, I don't know, a lightweight aluminum. It's made of like recycled Coke cans. It's just garbage. Uh, as I started pulling mine apart, I found three pieces, but there's more that's missing somewhere. So it was not just kind of cracked. It was broken into a lot of bits and pieces. Uh, so that's pretty bad. Um, and so I'm now trying to like fix this. <laughs> so I, I pulled off the bumper so that I can kind of better assess things. I have ordered the, uh, the rough stuff frame stiffener kit for the front. And you know, a lot of the, the XJ has, you know, that unibody frame and there's a lot of companies that make a frame stiffener kit. And there's, it kind of comes in three sections and the front section goes from like the, uh, floorboards under the, the gas and brake and clutch pedal forward to the, you know, where the bumper mounts. Then there's the center section that goes from, you know, the entire floor pan. And then the rear section goes from like the leaf spring mount, uh, to the very back. So it's done in three sections and it really wasn't bad. It, I think it was under a hundred bucks for that front section. It's basically three pieces of three sixteenths plate steel that all kind of like match together and you have to clamp it in and get it to form to the, the frame rail correctly before you weld it all in. Now that I have a welder and I'm becoming a more confident welder, I think this was a, a project that I could tackle myself. It's just, there's a fair amount of disassembly that you have to get into it. Uh, so like, the track bar mount on the driver's side, that has to come out. Um, as I started messing with the steering box, I realized that it's got a pretty severe leak on the input side. And there's that bolt that's sheared off, and I'd have to do an extraction. So I figured, you know what? It's just time for a new steering box. I don't need to mess mess with that. I've got enough, enough other projects. I'm starting to run out of time, uh, or at least I, I feel like I just want to get it back on the road. We're back on the trails uh, so got the steering linkage all taken apart. I got the pitman arm, uh, removed. I took out the coils so that I really have the coil springs. So I have room to, to get in there and do some welding. And, you know, once I finally got them out, you know, one, the bump stops that I have are that super hard polyurethane stuff. And it, it's one I just I replaced them like a year ago, and I've already destroyed one. Like it's cracked halfway through, hmm. so that's got to go. Uh, I need to replace that. Um, and I'm looking at getting the metal cloak. They're called Duro Springs, so it's more like a like an open cell foam rubber, like high density foam rubber, and so instead of a polyurethane, so it actually has some cushion to it. Um, so you don't just I don't know. You don't bottom out when you hit the bump stop anyways, but it feels right. like it. And so. Hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. You know what I hear, Dan? Uh, I hear behind Dan's head. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. Oh, my gosh. Cha-ching. <laughs> I know it. Cha-ching. I know it. I've been spending money like it's going out of style. So I haven't ordered those yet because they're made for, they don't make them for the XJ, which has a smaller um, bump stop like cup where it slides into. Uh, but the, the TJ one, it's a little bit bigger and it's, that's what it's made for. So if I order that, or I guess when I order that for metal cloak, I also need to order the YJ, uh, or TJ bump stop cups so I can cut my, cut mine off, weld that one in there. And the springs that I've had, you know, they've been through upstate New York. They've been through all kinds of stuff. They're in pretty bad shape in terms of just aesthetically there's a lot of rust on them and all the the powder coating on that spring it's toast uh and then to make things worse they're kind of bent 
Uh, they no longer sit directly straight up and down. I thought maybe that was just a function of being loaded, like having the weight of the Jeep on them. But once I got them out, there was still a little bit of a bend to them. So I figured maybe it's time to replace those. Because really, that's the last moving part in my suspension front or rear that I have not replaced since I bought the Jeep in 2004. So it's long overdue. Um, but this is an 8-inch lift, and there's not a lot of 8-inch lift coil springs out there for XJs. So I went back to Skyjacker, and I've ordered their uh, dual-rate 8-inch lift springs. So the top, whatever, three or four wraps on the coil are a thinner... Um, higher spring rate. So it's softer. And so those, when you just look at it riding on the street, it's going to look like those springs are completely compressed. Uh, but when you really flex out the suspension, those coils will, ex will expand and at least keep you in contact with the ground for another inch or two, It'll put some of that down pressure. So your tires can actually get some traction and go. Um, so they were having a sale. Uh, so it just happened to be like, now was the t good time to go. Uh, Actually, the springs weren't on sale, plus they had a promo code because I guess the Alaska, uh, or not Alaska, the Texas Independence Day was this week. Uh, so they had a, a promo code celebrating that. So 15% off on top of an already sale price, you know, for for less than 250 bucks, I'll get a set of brand new long travel dual, dual race nice. coil springs. Yeah, that works. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so let's see. Talked bump stops, talked coils, talked frame repair. Um, let me make sure I my notes, I, I got everything. Oh, so I was also thinking about um, turning my Pitman arm into a double shear arm. Uh, so that way, if I put a bracket on the Pitman arm that comes down and attaches to both ends of the the bolt because I've upgraded to the one ton steering. But at this point, I don't think that's a problem. I just need to make sure that bolt is good and tight because there was a little bit of play in the bolt. I think it's just because it wasn't tight all the way. I'm not familiar. What does this do? Uh, so, you know, if you look in the show notes, there's a picture. You'll have to find the Pitman arm and the one yeah. ton steering the drag link. There's just a right. bolt that goes through the pitman arm, through the drag link, and a nut that holds it all together on the other side. Um, and a double shear pitman arm would have a bracket that comes down from the leading edge, the front edge of the pitman arm, and then would connect uh, underneath that uh, the drag link, and then the nut would capture it all. So okay. that way it provides additional stability on that bolt so it's captured on both ends got it so right now it's a single shear setup whereas the double shear would have you'd have to like slide the bolt through the pitman arm through the drag link through the other side of the pitman arm double shear side and then the nut would go on okay so, however i think makes sense this project like i said has spiraled out of control so i'm going to abandon that plan <laughs> <laughs> and just finish what I've already got here. I think this is plenty. Um, it's called owning a Jeep. Oh my gosh! But this is a this is a fairly significant project. So, so wait a minute. Did you end up going wheeling or not? No, nope. I <laughs> I figured it'd be a bad idea. All, that was the whole point. You know, like you went out to go wheeling and yeah. You found a problem. Yeah, well, and, and I'm so, sure everybody, I'm sure everybody at home is going, okay. Well, did he go wheeling? No, <laughs> no. This was like a a bad omen here because the last time we were out in Calico, wheeling around in the Jeep, uh, we came across another guy in a, in a Jeep Cherokee who snapped all three steering box bolts on the trail out there in Calico, and that's where we were going. So I was like, no, nope, if I'm already down one bolt and the, the frame is coming apart and my steering box is linking, like, nope, I am not going to be that guy that goes out on the trail to... knowing it's broken just to make it worse. Yeah. Is there any way to box that in? Do they have a uh, – to 
to make that area strong. They they got to make something well, that makes so, that area stronger for that steering box. Yeah, that doesn't come apart like that. So I do already have the steering box brace, and there's a, a rod that connects to from the steering box, uh, like the housing on the sector shaft. You know, the sector shaft being the bolt that actually. Well, I mean, it's not a bolt, but it's a a part that runs from the top of the steering box down and connects to the pitman arm. And then there's that, like, worm gear on the inside where you're – this really should be a good visual. Somebody should have an animation on how this all works. So the steering wheel <laughs> connects to the uh, the steering shaft, and it goes into the steering box. And inside the box is this worm gear, and then that connects to the sector shaft – that is, you know, perpendicular to the that worm gear, and the sector shaft connects to the pitman arm. I feel like I'm the knee bone connects to the just, whatever. Just remember, <laughs> visual <laughs> stuff thing. always translates well in a podcast. Oh my gosh! So. Yeah, so just go to the show notes. <laughs> you'll you'll be able to. Uh, maybe I'll put a link in there. Somebody's gonna have an animation. Otherwise, just YouTube it. How a steering box works. Uh, but you know, once I put that three sixteenth inch plate steel on both sides, uh, it's, it goes on the outside of both frame rails. And, so and that's that, what I'm talking about. That yeah. should stiffen it up. Oh yeah. And I, I've talked to some folks, got feedback on Instagram and everybody said like, once you do that huge difference in how the, the overall driving feel. <laughs> it's like, Oh wait, damn it turns. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And then with the new steering box itself, like all the play is going to come out. Like it's going to, it's going to feel like I'm driving a sports car uh, compared to what it was before. Lots of wandering, lots of dead spots uh, in the steering. So now my concern though is, you know, I've got the ARB bumper and the bumper fits on to the frame rails pretty precisely. Uh, so once I add three sixteenth inch plate to each side, it's not going to fit the same way. So... I mean, that, that's a problem that I got to solve once I get all the other stuff done. Can you sandwich it on the outside and just use maybe a longer bolts? Well, that's the thing. Like, those mounting brackets are a set distance from each other. So now when I try to oh, slide okay. them back on, they're going to hit this now wider frame rail setup. Well, I mean, if you leave the bumper on and can you... Well, so I thought about it, that. Put but, it on the outside of the bumper bracket, so it's it's squeezing the outside of the bracket and kind of helps it out. Um, is it two piece or is it a U piece where you're gonna be you're you don't have a choice? So the bumper has to come off or it slide up in there. Yeah, so the bumper's got to come off because the uh, frame stiffener kit goes from the bumper mounting surface, like you know, there's the three bolts that mount from the sides coming in and then two bolts that come from underneath. So each side of the bumper is held in place by five bolts. Very stout, uh, very great connection. However, the it's, it's going to interfere. Uh, I, I can already tell. So, you know, I've already con contemplated, like, maybe I just put the high lift jack with the jaws facing out and uh, give it a couple cranks and see if maybe that bends it out enough that I can get it in a place. What I want to avoid doing is cutting the bumper mounting brackets. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. want to make that new, but I'm not opposed to it. I've already talked to talked to some folks. Uh, well, you got a welder. You can put it back together. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and I've, I've been getting a lot of practice welding um, lately. I, helping a friend here uh, lives in the neighborhood helping him build a uh, coastal off-road bumper uh so you know he bought the bumper and he just i don't know he trusted my welding skills more than his own <laughs> good luck with sucker. that plan guy but uh <laughs> yeah sucker <laughs> yeah but no i mean it's i'm certainly not to the point where my my welds look like art but uh for being <laughs> flux core welding like it looks pretty good not gonna lie I, I feel like it's it's getting great penetration with the uh, the forney welder um hey as, i'm as really long happy as the with it. hey if as long as the vehicle ain't upside down nobody's gonna see the welds 
That's true. <laughs> um, I mean, th- I'll, I'll put some pictures here on the show notes as well. So anybody who wants to see all the pictures of everything that I'm talking about and how bad it is, just go to the 4 by 4 podcastcom slash 162. And that'll be the show notes. There will be pictures in there. And all of the links for all of the news that we're about to discuss will also be there. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, talk about some news here. Um, so first up is something I, I've always really kind of thought was cool. Um, seeing old body styles kind of grafted onto new vehicles. And this one, an article from Jalopnik, is a 1979 Ford uh, F-Series truck that's been grafted onto a Raptor. Uh, 2014 Raptor. It, it, this is this is awesome. So what I like about this, too, is that this is the V8 Raptor, uh, not the, the V6 one. <laughs> and so this is the rolling chassis with the drivetrain, all the interior Everything except for the exterior skin is from a Raptor. So you get all, all the power and all the reliability of a newer vehicle, uh, all the drivability, except with the you know more classic uh, looks of the uh, the seventy nine. And actually, even the interior has been kind of modified to match the overall feel. So there's some pictures in here that show like the like a walnut uh, kind of accents to the dashboard. You know, the seats have been replaced to match the uh, the yellow paint job. Uh, this is this is pretty awesome. Not gonna lie. Is this something that uh, that it's you guys cool. would wheel? Yeah, they had to stretch that cap four inches to make it fit on there, which is amazing because I mean, you, you can it's tell. very clean. Yeah. Well, I mean, other than the fact that they took most of these photos with a potato. (laughs) In the dark, a potato after sunset. (laughs) Yeah. I like how they put the keypad, that Ford digital keypad on the door. Yeah, that's a dead giveaway (laughs) that something is different about this. Yeah. Yeah. That was very cool. Modern technology wrapped up in an old package. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not completely. The retro, bag. the retro looks are are kind of cool. I mean, everybody's kind of like going backwards. Everybody, the last you know, like ten years, everybody's been doing old body styles. Yeah, kind of. That's what I feel. You know, using the old names and bringing out this. You know, uh, bringing out the old style because some of those styles were really nice. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this style Ford, but. Uh, it's cool to see people are stepping outside the box and doing something different. But see, what I'm interested in is um, what happened to the uh, original Raptor that they tore apart for him to decide, oh, well, this thing is so messed up enough that I might as well just put another body on this frame. Yeah, well, I mean, it couldn't have been that messed up. Otherwise, like, yeah, it'd been mean, framed. Frame still good. <laughs> yeah. You know, those are the kinds of common things that uh, that show up on Raptors bent yeah. frames. <laughs> and some people just have money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True. I am not that guy. But... I'm not. Yeah, me neither. But yeah. <laughs> that's why days, we're maybe. that's why we're sitting around doing a podcast. <laughs> Hopefully, this podcast. <laughs> Hopefully, this podcast will start paying off, and I start. <laughs> Yeah, don't hold your breath for that. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Checks in the mail. Yeah. All right, Rich. Been doing this for doing this for how long? And I haven't seen oh, yeah. raise yet. We're coming. <laughs> we're coming up on ten years, and and we'll have some big news on a future episode talking about how we're going to celebrate uh, entering the the tenth year. Started this thing back in twenty eleven. That was a long time ago. Yeah. So, all right, Rich. Next up, what you got? Uh, 2022 Nissan Frontier. It's the biggest news, biggest design change out of Nissan. And like, since they designed the Frontier like 50 years ago, <laughs> same body style. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's a sharp looking truck. I'm not going to lie. It looks an awful lot like most other midsize trucks now. Um, you look at it and it's got a striking resemblance to a combination of, I don't know, a GMC and a Toyota Tacoma. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Yep. <laughs> Totally yep. agree. There, and there's a little yeah. bit of a Ranger front end to it, too, as well. Like, you know, where it's got Ranger yeah. stamped on the, the top, you know, they've kind of yep. stolen that. Yep. But, but, I mean, it's a sharp-looking truck, and, and honestly, it's what people want. That's why the trucks all look like this now. Yeah. Um, but the article I'm looking at, it's an autoblog article um, from February 4th, and it's comparing all of the mid-sized trucks. Um, so it's comparing to the Ranger, the Tacoma, the Colorado, the Gladiator. For some reason, they didn't include the bridge line in this. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <sighs> it's, you know, and it's it's still early in the phase of the frontier. So a lot of the numbers are missing and stuff. But we do know that it's going to have a 3.8 liter V6, which is going to be the highest displacement of all of that lineup. Um, it's going to be putting out more horsepower, 310 horsepower, uh, compared to the next in line, which would be the Chevy Colorado 308. And the only thing, the smallest displacement motor is the Ford Ranger with that 2.3 liter in line four. It's the turbo, right? Yeah. It's putting out 310 foot pounds where the Nissan's going to be uh, 281. Here's what I find crazy though. It's got the lowest, yeah, the lowest max tow rating of all of them at 6720 and the second lowest max payload. Which is weird because, you know, I think Frontier, I mean, yeah, the Frontier's got a, a pretty robust frame. Like, I feel like it right. should be able to tow more. Right. But it's all in the gearing. So it's got to be transmission and gearing is, yeah. is my guess. Yeah. Or braking. Right. Well, it's now you got, look, you're looking at the Nissan is going to be a nine-speed automatic. The Ford Ranger is a 10-speed automatic. The Toyota is a six-speed, the Chevy is an eight-speed, and the Jeep yeah. is I an eight-speed automatic. So, I mean, with that, with gearing, depending on your gearing, I mean, yeah, you could take it and gear, gear that 310 horsepower to a different thing, but then that you're changing your gas mileage numbers, but, you know, you you can pull it right pull anything if you change the gears but drivability is out the window i don't know if it's due you know maybe they were going for a fuel economy thing i don't know why they wouldn't boost those numbers because that's typically the numbers that most truck owners pay attention to the most right yeah so a fuel economy unfortunately we don't know what that rating is yet but i'd be curious if maybe that is why those numbers are as low as they are, but, um, it's a really good article. There's a ton of information in there, more information than we could ever go into on the podcast. Yeah. So it's definitely worth reading, but it, it spells out all your cab sizes, your bed options, and, and does a really good comparison of all of them. Yeah. And it's funny. Like I recognize this region here. There's all the Joshua trees on the, the pictures of the frontier. Oh, yeah. So that is definitely down in my backyard. Uh, What's a little bit frustrating is missing is the price. I was hoping to see yes. the actual price point on this because, you know, the, the Frontier uh, is the last one to make updates out of all the midsize trucks. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, the Tacoma and the Ranger um, and, you know, I don't know. I, I guess we can't really say the I, Gladiators grabbed a big segment or a big portion of the segment because they're – they've priced themselves into a, a little bit of trouble. Right. I think my, my guess is, is, is starting base price is going to be right around 25, 26. Yeah. Yeah. And which I wish they would come in just a little bit lower. Uh, and I think they're going to need to, if they really intend to pull some sales away from somebody who's cross shopping right. the Tacoma or the Ranger. Right. And then, you know, once it kind of, gains popularity then they can jack the price back up or something but as they coming in with the brand new update on this uh if they're going to make a strong showing they need to bring yeah. that price down i just think it'll be comparable to the toyota which is they'll, crazy I, 
Yeah. That, yeah, I know. I disagree. I think it's going to come in less than the Toyota. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, you've got that Toyota tax. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you're going to get that Nita, Nissan tax, too, because, I mean, it's just. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's the same, though. Yeah, it's not the same. It's. Yeah, I think they're going to be pretty much the exact same price, right in the same range. I mean, to me, they almost look like the exact same truck. Yeah. You I'd know, be curious. So. I haven't. I'm a few episodes behind. I'm sure Nissan Nation has talked about it. I'm, I'd be curious yeah. to hear what they say. Yep. Me as well. Anyway, we'll see that one here. Hopefully in a few weeks, they'll release some pricing updates. And when they do, we'll we'll talk about it. See who's right. But, all right, Craig. Next. You got the uh, next one here. Yeah, the bad news bear. Thank you. Yeah. I get the bad news one. <laughs> yeah. The recall and the stick shifts for the Wrangler and the Gladiator from, let's see, what was it? Uh, 2000, no. Uh, yeah, 2000, August 23rd, 2017 to January 20, uh, 22nd, 2021. Uh, I guess they're having... Uh, if you have a manual, I guess they're having sticking problems. The plates are sticking, the shifters not, and uh, I guess they're rolling it down to being the shift fork. Something's wrong with the shift forks. It looks like, um, yeah, and it's burning stuff up, and uh, they're so that really stinks. I mean, I thought <laughs> like burnt clutch. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it stinks like burn clutch. Yeah, really. And we all, know, if we, mean, you know, even if you drive an automatic, you know what that smells smells like. You know? Yeah. I wonder what percentage of Wrangler and Gladiator sold were manuals. I mean, it says almost forty three thousand units are affected. But I mean, I could. I mean, go that's, into the research that's a combined that, number. But I'm not going to do that. Yeah, it is. Well, there's only what just under seven just over six thousand gladiators yeah okay um, well otherwise there's... it's 30 almost thirty seven thousand wranglers but i'm yeah. curious what percentage of wranglers and gladiators sold are manuals yeah well so here's what is kind of frustrating to me this is a voluntary recall whatever and the way that they're fixing this is a software that reduces the engine torque uh to prevent damage to the the inner pressure plate so well that sucks <laughs> <laughs> like the times when you're going to need all of the torque uh the engine's just gonna like throttle itself down uh so that so it doesn't i don't know it's it's very frustrating the way they instead of like fixing the clutch plate uh, and the shift fork and everything like we're just gonna turn the engine down you just won't get all the power come on well i mean it I don't know. It says, yeah, I mean, it says it's a software related issue that's causing them to fail. And I think more what it is is. How much software is there in a manual transmission? That's why it's a manual transmission. Well, you got to remember everything's everything's computer. You know, (laughs) you have computer throttle. I bet you it's a computer controlled clutch. It's not no cable running to it. I bet you. I mean, there's still a, a clutch pedal. Yeah, but it doesn't mean yeah. that there's a wire that runs to it. That could so be, is it? it, I, don't, it I don't know. I, is it, it a it, dry, it might it a be a wire clutch? It might there's be. There's no way. Yeah. I mean, make so it. I guess right. I wouldn't be the first I don't know time. if Somebody they're listening has to know a manual Wrangler. So yeah. comment. Let us know. Is, is the Wrangler a drive-by-wire clutch? I'd be curious. I don't know. I would, I've never seen one. It I wouldn't mean, be the first time. I think we've talked about some other. I can't remember which vehicle it is. It's got like basically an unstallable clutch. I can't remember who it was now that makes that. Anyway, so maybe that's a thing. A drive by or a clutch by wire, not just a throttle by wire. I don't know. I still think it's a cop out, and some Jeep engineers uh, are being punched in the nose by the penny pinchers instead of solving this correctly with some sort of engineering solution. It's a, a software solution. Well, everything's huh. a software solution. It seems like nowadays. Yeah. Well, it's a software avoidance. 
it's the cheaper cheaper solution yeah <laughs> whatever all right I'm, I'm done being angry about that let's move on to something a little more interesting <laughs> so it's been a while since we've talked about the land rover defender the new 110 and so we've got an article yeah. here the uh from autoblog this is they're calling it their luggage test as proof like in case you failed geometry, like you can fit more square things into a square container. Duh. Um, but this is, they're kind of going through what's really, I think, going to be useful as people start using the Defender 110, the new Defender 110, as an Overland platform on like how you can fit all your junk into the trunk area and. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Twelve year old and he's laughing. <laughs> uh, so you know we've got the the barn door swing open uh, swing gate instead of the, like the lift gate on this. Uh, and so one of the things that I liked about the FJ Cruiser that I had is that the swing gate opens in a manner that's designed for North American market. Ah, uh, uh, but this is this British. one goes the other way because it's British. Yeah. Uh, so that's just one thing that kind of you know an annoyance here. Um, let's see. Uh, it's what they're doing is, is they're taking, I feel like they're taking strong cues from the, the Japanese, what were they? The Japanese K cars. Yeah. You know, the Nissan cube, uh, the Honda, what was it? Honda element. Um, those things that the more it's easier to pack stuff into a square yep. than it is to put stuff into stuff with a whole bunch of curves and angles in it. Yep. And if you look at the inside of this thing, there is a ton of space. Yeah. A ton. Yeah. So that giant swing door, uh, there's not a lot of like room around the corners. Once you get the door open, that kind of hidden area, like it's really wide open. You can fit a lot of stuff in there. Uh, the surface, the texture of it, you know, it's it's made to be used. Run some heavy yeah. objects around it. Yeah. Uh, think, tie down Honda Element. Yeah. That's yeah. essentially what this is, is a very expensive Honda element. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what I didn't realize is they've got like the subfloor, kind of like the, the new Wranglers have. I just pissed off. By the way, I just pissed off a ton of uh, Land Rover owners out there. <laughs> <laughs> Own it. You know, the element is, it's super popular. Uh, there's a, somebody has got an Instagram there's account that is phenomenal. <laughs> Like turned it into yeah. a camper, and they've got uh, like plywood, CNC cut plywood conversion stuff to make a sleep platform and a cabinetry, and there's some really cool ones out there. Um, what I didn't realize is the the subflooring stuff underneath the the cargo area. So they've got the the jack parts and everything that fit back there, and then just like a an empty spot. Um, I'm not sure what that one's really supposed to be for, except you know hidden storage area. Because the spare tire is on the outside. Straps, you know. Yeah, you could put, that's where you put your stuff. Put more junk in the trunk. But, I don't know. It's cool, cool setup. And having They've got little cubbies everywhere. Yeah. I mean, like they've even got like little elastic bands on the C-pillars that you can strap stuff in there. Um, Yep. There's all kinds of stuff. I think it's clear that this was designed by somebody who actually used it. And, and kind of yeah. lived with it for a little bit and put some thought into it and kind of avoid some of those uh, annoying things. Maybe it's an overlander. <laughs> I, I, a I would overlander. imagine it was. The way they did their press announcement, bringing everybody to, to Africa to, to show them. You know, one of the other things I as I'm scrolling through here is pretty cool. You know, it's got the air ride suspension, kind of like the Ram trucks do. Right. Hopefully there's sensors are designed better. Um, but there's buttons in the back to help raise and lower the vehicle. Um, you know, if you're lifting something very heavy uh, and you want to get just that little bit more squat to, re- you know, lower the the loading height, the button is back there in the back. That's super smart. Yeah. What I find interesting is if you look at the back of the, the tailgate or the cargo gate, whatever you want to call it, tailgate, um, there's a little table built into it. Yeah. It's got to be a very little table because it's not, it's only the thickness of the plastic, which is what, maybe three inches. Sure. But, <laughs> you know, it's something to, to set something on. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I couldn't tell? And 
you know, this has kind of been one of my annoyances. Like, is there a latch on the inside of the door? So if, if somebody were to convert this into, you know, an overland platform where you're sleeping on the inside, would you have to like scrounge around, hit the pop a lock, or do you have to like climb through one of the, the rear doors or is there a latch yeah. where you just open that rear door from the inside? I do. I do not see a latch. Yeah. Well, so there is that little cutout handle. Um, I don't yeah, know if that's it's the possible. Or... It, yeah, it's possible it could be inside there. I don't know. So, so I'm going to go one? with no. Yeah, probably not. I have seen one. What do you think? I like it. Uh, I like it a lot. I really do. It's a good looking vehicle. Yeah. Uh, to me, it kind of pops up against the Ford Bronco Sport. I'm not too big of a fan right now. Yeah. I I do not like the sport. Like somebody can send me hate mail and tell me why I'm wrong, but I, I don't like the sport. I don't care for it. The yeah, Defender the one though, the little one, right? Yeah. 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 That's the one that they're really kind of promoting the most in commercials from what I've seen, because I think that one's going to need the most salesmanship to get moved off the, the dealer yeah. lots. The yeah, two-door and the four-door big boy Bronco, that one's going to sell itself just based on capability alone. Um, but the, the Sport, it's going to need some effort. But this one, you know, the Defender, after seeing it in person, I really do like it. I think the diamond plate stickers that they put on the – you know, front quarter panel fender tops. Like that's, that's a little hokey. Yeah. Maybe put some bracing under the fenders and actually make it something that you could step on, uh, instead of just, you know, be a styling cue. Yeah. But I mean, there's no need. <laughs> no. Well, yeah. so like anything else, the older these get, uh, if they expect them to kind of age, well, they're eventually going to be seeing some trail use, by by people who can afford uh, a vehicle, but when was when was the last time you needed to stand on your hood? Um. <laughs> well, oh, you're gonna have an answer, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever had to stand on my hood. Well, if you have a rooftop tent, there's a chance that it's gonna happen. Yeah. But since you have an RV now, you know you RV put a trailer, you don't have to worry about. It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really guess I haven't uh, just because of the way I've got my rocker guard steps set up and the fact that I've got pretty wide wheel OL openings. I can, you know, if I need to use something on the roof rack, I can stand on top of the tire and I'm not like bang my shins against the the fender. Right. But I could see some use for it on some occasion. It may be a stretch, but it could happen. But, you know, if it's going to be there, that gum. Make it useful. <laughs> Otherwise, just rip that oh, come on. ugly sticker off. You know what? People out there, I just want you to say, I stood next to Dan. He's going to stand next to one of these defenders, and he's just going to be able to reach the other <laughs> side of the vehicle from the driver's side and go over and touch the yeah. windows on the passenger side. That's fair. I do have You're a not fairly... going to need anything to step on. That's Dan. true, but my wife is super short. And yeah, you just pick her up and put her on the hood. <laughs> you pick her up and put her on the roof. You don't need to put yeah. her on the hood. Now, you know, it's funny. Like, the I find myself standing and climbing on the top of my Humvee hood all the time. Uh, there's definitely boot marks on the little stencil that says uh, no step here. Um, <laughs> you but don't own that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but it also, like, it's much wider. Like, if you're going to reach the you're, middle of the window, like, you got to climb on top yeah. of that bad boy. Uh, oh, yeah. You, of course. I, I guarantee you treat that Humvee very differently than you do any vehicle in your garage. That's true. And, and mainly it's because like I don't have to be it. the one that fixes it. <laughs> Drove it like you stole it. Yep. Um, all right. So I, I think we may have gotten these out of order here. Uh, let's see. The next news article that we have to talk about is a new off-road racing series. This is the Great American Short Course, and they announced this one at uh, King of the Hammers. I was out there uh, and um, kind of heard the the announcement of this one because, you know, Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series has shut down due to, you know, financial stuff. Um, but the, you know, Dave Cole from Hammer King that, you know, 
pushes the the king of the hammers race him and the race series director lee perfect which is i don't know a, a very appropriate name uh, they have kind of picked up the ashes of Lucas off-road racing series and, and filled in there with this uh, great American short course. And, and they launched this with, we talked about the class 11 bugs racing around on the, the short course there. And that was the kind of thing that I think we're going to be seeing. Uh, so the the success that they've seen of the Ultra 4 series is going to be just expanded as they bring in uh, the the uh, Pro 2, Pro 4 trucks, uh, the the Class 11 bugs, just a way for people to get out and do a lot more racing. Uh, and what they've been able to do with Hammer King in terms of their live streaming packages and all the sponsorships that are coming in, it's going to really be a great event for spectators to come and watch, uh, those that want to race. It's going to be a great way for people to get more opportunities to uh to be seen for their sponsors and everything. So it is a really cool series. I'm looking forward to this one. Um, what I don't know is when we're going to be able to start seeing these uh, events, but it's cool to see the racing series picking up, filling a gap. And uh, I don't know. It'll be fun. Oh, great American short course. So the short version, the acronym gas. <laughs> What's a better acronym for a racing series? Nailed it. Love it. Um, okay. Uh, that's enough for the news. Uh, so we do have something here in the Off-Roading 101. And this is something that I do not have, but I have found myself many times wishing that I had one. Something as simple as a thread checker. So all those random nuts and bolts, as you remove them, uh, and they're all boogered up, and you just want to go get a new nut or bolt, like you see this at, like if you go into Home Depot or Lowe's or something, there's that board that has like all of the measurements. It's got marked on there and you just take your messed up bolt and you kind of thread it in there. Like, okay, this is a half inch by 20 thread pitch uh, bolt. Now I need to go get the I new used, one. I used one today. See, like that's, yeah. I don't know why I don't have one of these. This actual tool was uh, the one on the wire uh, that you are presenting to us yeah. today. Uh, actually, uh, I saw the the reveal of this item at SEMA when I was at SEMA that year. This is the just like... Checker? This came out that year uh, the one company showed it to me. I was just like, oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. You know, because most everybody just has the boards, just have a board. But yep. this thing, you know, having it in your, be able to have it in your toolbox and be able to pull it out. Okay. Ooh, you know, because you're not going to be, you, if you have a, 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 a nut that's attached to your vehicle and you, you can't find a bolt that fits it. You're able to take this thing to the vehicle yeah, and go and then be able to, instead of go find a bolt that finally gets it right, then take it and then, Oh, take it to the, yep. <laughs> so do three steps. This is just one step. Yeah. And what you're talking about is essentially like it's a stubby all laced together on a cable. Each one of these has the threads and on the other side is the like, it's not a nut, but it's a well, you internally male threaded. And female end, basically, yeah. yeah, you male end and your female end. Yep, of the same and exactly. with the same thread pattern, inside and out, and it pretty much just looks like a a, a socket at first. I mean, when you look at it, if you glance at it, it looks like a socket. Sure, all tied on a cable string. All tied on a cable string, and so you can't lose them because they're all in, and they're all you know. Yeah. So. I so, saw this and I thought it was a great idea and uh, yeah. just, I need to go ahead and order uh, one in both metric and standard. So that's one of the frustrating things I've, as I've been going back and forth Jeep, you know, it's an international brand. So like the Cherokee was sold all over the place. Uh, so it's, it actually has a mix of <laughs> metric. There's mostly metric. However, now with all the aftermarket stuff that's been put on, I, I've got a mix. So yeah. 
I know. believe this one has metric and standard all in one. This whole one wire has both all together. Oh, you're right. So oh you gosh. don't have to buy separate ones. It has everything. It has every thread pattern. It has every uh, size of bolt. Oh, this is going into the need. Amazon cart yep. as soon as we're done here. And <laughs> they they range anywhere from twenty eight dollars up to seventy dollars. Yeah, so eighty dollars. Yeah, wow. I, I did see Sounds one like that was a little gold more plated or something. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't need it to be made of unobtainium. I just need it to be able to tell me what yeah. what size bolt and thread pitch and everything. And we're good to go. Pretty cool. Yeah, very good thing um, to have. I in had your to. Tool bag. We might have to include a link in the show notes. Yeah. To those. Yeah. So right now in the show notes, I had a link to the article that kind of reminded me that I need this. I'll put the link in there. Uh, so speaking of affiliate links, I do have one in here for the, the gear review segment on the Yes Welder Flux Core MIG wire. Uh, and this is what I've, I bought a two pound uh, spool based on somebody's recommendation and absolutely loved how it performed. Like I, I did not expect it to perform as like a, a big a difference between like the Harbor Freight and Lincoln and stuff, the, the other stuff that you get at the big box store. Like this one is light years better. Um, when I, I showed one of my buddies, uh, who lives kind of, you know, a couple streets down, he's been doing a lot of work. He's got an old G body, uh, that he's turning into a drag race car. Uh, so we're comparing welding stuff and he's like, Oh man, you're so my, he was saying that my flux core welds look better than his with gas. Um, of course mine's creating a lot more dust because it is a flux core weld. Um, but this Yes Welder wire is phenomenal. Uh, so you can get this in both the 2-pound spool or the 10-pound spool, depending on what your machine accepts. Um, but I can tell you, I, I went through one bo- one spool of that 2-pound, and I ordered a 10-pound spool, and I accidentally ordered two. So I, I'm good to go on welding wire for a very long time. <laughs> long as time. Yeah, but uh, I certainly didn't try to return it. Like, I'm going to eventually use it. Uh and what I do like as well is that the slag, you know, it uses a little chip and hammer or whatever, and it comes off in big chunks, nice and clean weld underneath. The beads are, I, you know, I consider them beautiful. Like I said, it's not artwork or anything, but for what it is, it's phenomenal. I, I just, somebody's going to have to convince me that their wire is better by giving it to me, uh, and I, I'll put it to the test. And but, let's test it. Yeah, testing yeah. it. So far, comparing, you know, the different wires and different machines with other folks, like the Yes Welder wire on the 40, 140 multi-process machine that I've got, it, it's great. So I'm uh, very happy with that. We'll have a link here in the show notes. Uh, if you want to try it out for yourself. So that's it for that one. All right. Um, so our Onyx segment. So we are, you know, we've got an affiliate relationship with Onyx, um, but... I only tell you that because I am a big believer in in Onyx off-road app. I've had nothing but great experience with it. And the fact that it's very community-driven, continues to improve, and the, the team that's putting it all together, they're doing a great job. Uh, so we're going to highlight a trail on this episode. Uh, and this is the Big Bend. Um, it's in the Big Bend National Park down in Texas. And... You know, I lived in Texas, I don't know, 15 years ago, and one of the things that I regret is not having taken the time to go explore Big Bend National Park while I was there. So at some point, I'm still going to have to get down there. Uh, but we have a a picture uh, that kind of shows the specific trail that we're talking about um, and the kind of information that you get. This particular trail is a... Oh, I messed that one up there. Put the wrong picture in. Um, but this is a, a great trail to to kind of get familiar with. Um, still loading. All right, here it is. So this is an easy one, uh, four out of ten, but it's a long trail. Uh, 
38.5 miles with a, a high elevation point of 4,520 feet. Uh, is accessible by high clearance 4x4 and overland vehicles. And the Onyx team is recommending that you uh, explore this one in the spring and fall and winter, uh, mainly because it's southern Texas and it's going to be blazing hot in the summer. Uh, and this one is has been submitted by somebody, a friend of the show, uh, Laud Maroney. So I, it's it's fun to see people that listen to the podcast uh, have contributed to to the efforts here. And the pictures are, kind of show what it is that you can expect uh, when you're actually exploring the trail. There's some beautiful scenery. Uh, the sun rises and sunsets down there in southern Texas. Just beautiful. Uh, the trail description, uneven, rutted dirt trail, loose, loose rocks, sand, erosion, washes, uh, potential water crossings up to a foot deep, mud holes and obstacles up to 18 inches, including ledges and short, steep grades. Roads are typically one vehicle wide with places to pass. Um, so this is this is a really cool one. So if you want to check this out and sign up for Onyx Off-Road, uh, you can use our link. Just go to the 4x4podcast.com slash ONX for Onyx, and that'll take you right to the sign-up page. And it's still... 30 bucks for a whole year and you're going to get definitely $30 worth of value out of the app guaranteed. Um, and feedback. Uh, I, th- I think we got a couple emails, but messages, but I only brought the one in here. So we'll save the other ones for the next time. Uh, this is from John. He says, hi, I love the show. I know nothing about off-roading and listening to you guys banter. I've learned a lot through osmosis. A uh, quick question. Why do you never talk about Hummers such as the H2? Uh, so, I don't know. Why don't we talk about the H2? <laughs> you don't see very many of them That's, out yeah. there. It's, was, not, it's, not that they're, it's not that they're not out there. It's just it's they're not, they're not common. There's nothing yeah. wrong with them. I mean, to me, if you're going to go – I mean, if you're going to spend that kind of money – that's a full size. To me, it's a full size SUV, and you're not really going to go four wheeling that much with an H2. Most H2s are, to me, that I see are pavement pounders. I I don't see many off road. Well, so they're too expensive. I think to the prices lift. come down because nobody really wanted. Yeah, them. the prices. Yeah, it, the price is going down. Mean, I mean, we're yeah. talking about what twenty-year-old. Yeah, the H two right? hasn't been made yeah. for. Yeah, uh, but then finding time. a lift kit for it or doing stuff like that, it just, I to me, it, it's nothing wrong with Hummers. I mean, if you're going to give me an H one, yeah, I'll take it out well, and I'll wheel it all day. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> I know Dan knows what I'm talking about because he wheels one every day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough vehicle but, to live with and, on pavement, that's for sure. And, yeah. and but an H two to me, you know, is in the it is in the pound, uh, pavement pounder uh, segment of. It's going to be great for snow. Uh, it's going to be you know great for you know around town soccer moms, dads that wanted you know something. Yeah. Yeah. For their wives, hey, I got a Hummer. I, no, that well, to me a other, Hummer H2 is not a Hummer. A H1 is well, a Hummer. Well, I think the other drawback to the H2 really is is just the aftermarket. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean there is some aftermarket support. It's just not huge. It's like there's there's other better options out there for aftermarket support. So. Yeah, and so my thing is like for the exterior size and the dimensions, it's it's very, uh, I don't know, it, it has a lot of presence. But on the inside, it's not nearly as big. Like you know, I'm right. I'm six one. I uh, I don't think that I could actually lay down uh, without like going diagonally or you know be in the fetal position. So you're not really sleeping in the back if you're a big guy like me. Um, it's very heavy. I think they weigh in at like three tons. Uh, it's somewhere north of six thousand pounds, I think. Yeah, and, and it, being so, they looked so top heavy to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, now, what was the suspension? I mean, 
basically the frame and suspension on those was what? It's basically what a they? Tahoe. But uh, yeah, like a Chevy Tahoe. It was. Yeah, I just remember yeah. it had the IFS in the front, and that was what turned me off immediately. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, well, and the the tie rod ends two. on them were not up to turn in because I think a lot of them you can get them thirty three or thirty five inch tires, um, but the tie rod yeah. ends needed to be upgraded. That was kind of a weak point on them. Um, the fuel economy not great because it's so heavy. It's still I think it was a five point three liter. I should have looked this up before, but um, it's a it's a big V eight. I think it was a five three. Yeah. yeah, but it was still. Like, it didn't seem to matter whether or not you were pulling a trailer or just driving around town. He was, like, 11 miles a gallon. Didn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, it was just like, I mean, if I had the money, why buy a Hummer when I could buy a Suburban and get an extra seat in the back? That was pretty much the h2 to me it yeah. was just yeah. it I mean, was a got, niche vehicle it's a nice i mean some people really like them me i'm not too much of a fan yeah. of the h2s it's got um, a great approach and departure angles the the break over angle is is greatly improved if you take off the running yeah. boards on them um i always remember seeing like those things hang down far lower than they need to which is yeah that was another thing is i mean it uh, they sat up so high, you needed the running boards to get into it. Yeah. If you didn't have the running boards, you couldn't get in the Hummer in the first place. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, it was made for off-roading. Like, it had skid plates, uh, maybe not necessarily plates all the way, but it's they've got, like, a tube frame skid plate type of thing, which they borrowed from yeah. the, the H1 design. They had that, too. Um, yeah. I, I think hey, it had well, a limited slip, maybe a locker. I think it had a... An electronic. Locker. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. So it's certainly it certainly can. Well, I know that some of that uh, some vehicles had like the a the uh, what is it the it's kind of like the traction control or the brake. Uh, yeah, uh, anti like brake system. The anti like the brake system. Yeah, you could actually put your foot on it, and then with the analog brakes would actually help you crawl over things. Because you could use your foot on the brake and give it a little gas, and it would yeah. act like traction control and get you over things. Well, John, did I they think have the... the tire? Did they have the tire inflation system on the H two, or was that just on the H one? No, H1? no, no. Nope. just the one. Yeah, it was just, just the H one, and that yeah. wasn't even standard on all the H ones. That was a yeah option, I think. an option. Well, there you go, John. We just spent about four minutes talking about the H two. Yep. <laughs> Um, but hey, but like we said, we we I've said it before, and I think these guys agree with me. If you want an H two, don't listen to us. Do your own thing. Yeah, prove us wrong. Send us pictures. You know, do your do you on your vehicle. Yeah. Do what you want. Yeah, well, do what you want. Do what you, and you know what? Prove us wrong. Send us pictures of it. We want to see that. Look up on Instagram. I was probably a pile of. Uh, H2s being off-roaded somewhere and you know oh, yeah. most of them are likely somewhere in this is me stereotyping here they're probably in the south running through the mud and not crawling rocks and trails and stuff <laughs> well I, to me I think they're probably just going to be you know like I said pound pavement pounders but yeah. you know you also have some of the people that have a flat washboard road that is dirt that they have to go on every day sure but it, that know, I see it, but I don't see it being like, you know, full rock crawling. Yeah, it's a body it's not on a rock frame crawling vehicle SUV. So right there, it's got that going for you. And you know, if we can, maybe I'll look around see if we can find some aftermarket support with something. To, I don't know. Anyways, I think that's it. Like six minutes now. Yeah, six <laughs> minutes worth of H two talk. But there was. One more thing on done. I'm H2. done talking about H twos. Okay, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen one that uh, I've only seen one lift kit for a H two, and it was a six inch lift kit. Yeah, and it just seemed that it was like was way it too high. I bet it was chrome plated. No. <laughs> Anyways, twenty fours. I think that's it, it for it this was one. Was color coded, but. <laughs> 
Oh, 162 is going off Moving the rails on. already. Anyways, want to remind you that we are proud members of the 4x4 Radio Network. Head over to 4x4radio.com uh, and check out all the other shows here on the 4x4 Radio Network. Center Steer Podcast, where you can hear a, probably a lot more informative information about the new Defender 110 than we talked about. Uh, Jeep Talk Show or On the Trail with Kevin and Scott for all the Jeep stuff that you need. Uh, if you want to know who's going to buy the Nissan Frontier first, uh, tune into the Trail Chasers podcast because I'm sure one of those guys is, is going to get it there. All right. Thanks again to Artemis Overland Hardware for helping this show continue. Be sure to check them out, Artemis Overland Hardware, on Facebook, Instagram, and at ArtemisOverland.com. And go visit their new expanded space in Springfield, Missouri. If you have any feedback for us, uh, you can tell us uh, why the H2 should be used as a off-roading vehicle uh, or anything else. You can email us, the 4 x 4 podcast at yahoo.com. On Facebook, Instagram, and the Twitter, it is at the 4 x 4 podcast there. If you want to send us a voicemail, we haven't had any voicemail for a while, 719-924-5337. Save it into your speed dial, and you can text us whatever, or use the speak pipe tool there and send a, a higher quality message. But that's it for episode 162. Now it's time to hit the trails, unless your Jeep is busted like mine and Craig's. Uh, but tread lightly, God bless, and stay safe while exploring your world. 